Hi there. Hello. I'm Julia. I'm Dan. And I'm Timothy. And you are listening to Shout for Libraries on CJSR in Edmonton. We're a group of Masters in Library and Information Studies students here at U of A, and every month we bring you fresh library and information-centric news. Oh, I just love me some library-centric radio. Golly gee, and how. For those of you who have never tuned in to Shout before, every month we pick a topic relevant to librarianship and information studies and do serious investigative journalism. We go where the other library radio shows dare not go. Mm-hmm. No topic is too dry or too niche for us in our pursuit of hard-hitting library news. And on today's show, we will revisit a topic we discussed on the program three years ago, the politics of librarianship. Yeah, in our December 2016 episode, Shout for Libraries interviewed Sam Popowich, who is a Discovery Systems librarian here at U of A, about politics, librarianship, the myth of neutrality, Marxism, and the tension in librarianship between public service and a technocratic view that cataloging can be objective. And for today's episode, Joel and I sat down with Sam at CJSR HQ to discuss his brand new book, Confronting the Democratic Discourse of Librarianship, a Marxist Approach, out now on Library Juice Press. Here's that conversation. First of all, I just wanted to thank you so much for this book. It's I was saying to Tim that it feels so vital and it's so it's so it's so readable and it's so um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I hope so. It's so refreshing and heartening to uh, encounter a book within LIS, however we want to say that 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 is engaging with history and theorists and like it's just it's familiar terrain to me, mm-hmm. and that's. Uh, makes me feel not crazy okay that well that's a good a good sign <laughs> like which i often did feel last sure. year yeah reading a historical or mm-hmm. pieces where maybe one theorist was being introduced like you've referenced with like a really selective engagement with habermas mm-hmm. within lis when i was in library school which is like 12 years ago 12 to 14 years ago now. It, it was much the, the same thing. And it was probably a little bit worse because my library school was in the faculty of management, which so we, we were getting like all of this management stuff thrown at us. And there were a lot of people in my year and the year after me, especially who were critical of that, but there was nowhere to go with it. Um, and I, I feel like the landscape has completely changed. The crit lib, critical librarianship, which is around now where people are talking about a lot of these things has changed or at least given people an alternative space to talk about a lot of these things. And I was hoping that the book would, you know, summarize one particular trend or way of looking at things, even though there's many out there. So I'm glad it it resonated. Yeah, I found that, like, uh, it stands alone even as sort of an introduction to um, sort of more intersectional Marxism Mm -hmm. or Marxist theory, which is great, um, given the context and, and how alien sort of that is to library discourse in general. Yeah, I think while I was working on the book, a lot of the the research that I would come across would, as as Joel alluded to, kind of pick one little way of of addressing things, right? They'd pick Habermas or they'd pick Gramsci or they'd pick Bourdieu um, or they'd pick, you know, a sort of narrowly focused class analysis or they would... You you didn't so much see it with with gender and race where those were already a little bit broader than uh, the more narrowly focused kind of LIS positivist research. So it it was important to try and give a kind of broader account, which is one of the things that I think is missing from the dominant LIS way of looking at things, which which I talk about in the book, like how that came to be. Mm -hmm. Um, Can can you think of a moment when you when you um, decided to write the book? What what (laughs) what what was the genesis of it? Like, I know Rory Litwin got in touch with you, but yeah, the book exist. I know you had been blogging. Yeah. Uh, the book sort of existed. I mean, in a way, it, it goes all the way back to library school where I'd come across the references to Habermas in probably Bushman, read the structural transformation of the of the public sphere, which really got me back into thinking about like critical po- critical theory and politics and, and libraries. And so I wrote a term paper on, you know, how could we introduce critical theory more broadly into LIS? And I published a paper in the student journal kind of on a similar topic on, on kind of the, po- the politics of public library history, which brought in some of the, the historical parts. I'd also been reading at the time, Alistair Black wrote uh, New History of the English Public Library, where he he brought in a lot of social theory from the 19th century. He'd written some other articles that used Foucault. I really liked how he was applying that stuff. Once I 
finished library school and I was working, I just, you know, had my head down, was learning the job for seven to ten years. And then I started the started writing a blog, which kind of on its own ended up focusing back on some of those critical theory pieces that I'd been looking at in library school. And one of the first pieces that I wrote, or one of the first pieces that people seem to read, was uh, John Pateman, who's the CEO of Thunder Bay Public Library, had written um, a column where he kind of talked about, he, he kind of rehashed the, the democratic history of, of librarianship. And John is also a Marxist, but but he takes a very different perspective, I think, than I do. And I ended up writing a blog post that responded to him that tried to do some of this work of connecting, you know, sociopolitical changes, changes in the capitalist mode of production with particular moments in library history, just as a, as a, as a kind of counterweight to what he was putting out, which was the kind of more uh, normalized way of thinking about library history. That probably, that idea that library history needed to be connected to changes in the structure of capitalism was probably the genesis of the whole thing. And then there were other blog posts about that. There were, you know, I did a few presentations and that kind of thing, but there was nothing structured. There was nothing, you know, kind of this jumble of ideas in my head. I wrote a book chapter for the Politics of Theory book that Karen Nicholson and Maura Seale edited. And at the time I wanted that, I thought, okay, this book chapter will be where I get out all of my feelings about Marxism and librarianship. And of course you can't fit that into a book chapter. So the book chapter ended up being what it was. But then a little bit after that, where we got in touch, well, just to say, if I ever had an idea about writing a book to let him know. And I thought, well, maybe this is the opportunity then to kind of get out all of these, all of this thinking around class, around history, around intersectionality, you know, may, maybe this is the opportunity to just sit down there and do it. In in some ways, the origins of the book go way back to library school, and in some ways, they kind of were uh, an opportunity that I jumped at, you know, two years ago, kind of thing. Would Would we be able to go through the the periods that you draw? So I start from about 1850, which is when the Public Libraries Act was passed in Britain, and it's around the time that things like the Boston Public Library were founded. So 1850 seemed like a good moment to kind of begin this idea of connecting library history with uh, larger changes in capitalism. So 1848 is the revolution sweep Europe. Um, it's the last gasp of proletarian power following the French Revolution that is completely squashed by the finally victorious capitalist middle class. Um, 1848 is when Marx and Engels write the Communist Manifesto. 1850 is when the Public Libraries Act gets passed. And so it always seemed like there had to be a connection there. But from 1850 to uh, about the time of the First World War, you've got a triumphant capitalist class. You've got lots of technological advance. You've got lots of money. You still have periodic crises, but in general, things seem to be advancing really fast. And because the the capitalist class is committed to parliamentary democracy because they've just spent so much time wiping out the feudal nobility, they come up with this idea of democracy and popular participation, which requires then that they completely control it because they can't just let anyone vote. So they have to come up with institutions which create the right kind of citizen or subject for that period of triumphant capitalism. And they have a few different institutions. One is the public library. One is the public school system. Ursula Hughes, in her book about digital labor, talks about the the fact that capitalism now needed employees who could read and write. So they had to guarantee that that workforce was available. And so they created public schools and universal education. And so the first period of, of librarianship, you know, the beginning of the ALA, the period of Cutter and Dewey, is very much in line with a kind of technocratic, triumphant capitalism where where knowledge is transparent and you can provide the best books. Uh, I don't remember the motto of the ALA, but the best books for the lowest price to the most people, something like that. And there's no troubling of those ideas. Those ideas are, are very dominant. And then you hit the period of the First World War, the Depression, the Second World War. So the entire period from 1914 to 1945 throws this entire bourgeois project into crisis. Libraries have to struggle to figure it out. They end up coming down, for the most part, on the side of supporting the war against fascism, which, you know, means in the binary terms of capitalist logic, supporting the bourgeois state. Then after the Second World War, the second long period of kind of stability is the post-war settlement. 
the compromise between capital and labor and everyone pulling together. Bushman's favorite. Bushman's favorite. So John Bushman kind of thinks about the period af- between the Second World War and uh, the transition to neoliberalism in the early 1970s as a period when capitalism was doing what it was supposed to do, uh, making people more prosperous, increasing standard of living, things like that. Ed D'Angelo, in his book, Barbarians at the Gates of the Public Library, looks further back to that first period around the 1870s, which a period that when he calls what we would call classical liberalism, and he calls ethical liberalism, held sway. That's the period that he's looking back to as his golden age of of libraries under capitalism. And so, you know, the post-war settlement comes to an end with the transition to neoliberalism. There's another uh, long period of crisis. And, you know, one of the kind of common ideas in Marxist theories of ideology is that in those periods of crisis, ideology kind of doesn't work, right? All of people's positions and values become exposed and they can't be mystified and hidden to such a great extent. So that happened in the period of the wars. It happened in the transition to neoliberalism. And then, you know, the whole set back in with the, the end of history and the end of ideology after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, so you have this period from 1990, 91 till the global financial crisis, 2007 and 8, when um, you couldn't even think about talking about challenges to capitalism. Capitalism had proved its enduring value um, because it had outlasted Eastern, the, the Warsaw Pact countries and the Soviet Union. And each so each of those periods corresponds to a period of stable-ish uh, values in libraries and the dominance of this democratic discourse. And libraries are seen to be contributing and core partners in these periods of stability and and prosperity. I remembered a question yeah. Yeah. that I had arising exactly from this trajectory. Okay. I love how I think via Michael Harris, you articulate that there was a, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, a partisan librarianship before the construction of the neutral librarian paradigm. And it was almost like the war period. You're quoting a lot from Harris at that point in the book during the library myth section, mm-hmm. I think. The war period afforded a opportunity to rearticulate the vitality of libraries to the bourgeois society. Like if it was like fascism, they saw it as an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Do you see that as mirrored in contemporary times with uh, resurgent fascism? Yeah, and and I know Bushman has written on that as well. Like people saying our our our, our opportunity to prove our relevance has mm-hmm. has arrived again with resurgent fascism. Mm-hmm. Like that was a really interesting doubling mm-hmm. in the book that. I was thinking about. Yeah, there's this sense, I think, within the democratic discourse of librarianship where those moments of crisis are the moments for us to prove our value. And you see this, again, going back to the intellectual freedom discourse, you see this especially there, or maybe more starkly there, where the challenges posed by fascism, or now resurgent fascism, the right way to meet those challenges is to absolutely affirm the neutrality and objectivity of the library and a maximalist intellectual freedom, free speech view. Mm -hmm. And which you point out via Harris, there was an authoritarian librarianship that Mm -hmm. existed before that construction of the value neutral librarianship. I find that like the the, the Dewey. (laughs) The missionary, the library faith. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And and, and again, that's, I think, how librarianship mirrors all of these, these things that are happening in the broader society. So the transition to a computerized, scientific view of, like dominant view of the world after the war, at, with the rise of computerization, the rise of value-free, positivist social science, meant that librarians had to take the position that the profession was neutral, that they were scientists, that they were not partisan, that they were not subject to their, their own values. They were responsible to facts. They weren't responsible to values. So, so that's, that's part of the through line that's running through the book, is how the culture of librarianship always mirrors the underlying culture of the moment of capitalism that we're in. Going back to your point about the, the kind of doubling down on that position in moments of crisis, to me, that doubling down only ever serves the sustainability of capitalism. So if you don't have a problem fundamentally with the world, if you think the world either now or in the past was something worth sustaining, not fundamentally changing, then in moments of crisis, you are always going to take the the point of view that this is what we need to do to get things back to normal. This is what we need to do to make America great again. This is what we need to do to make sure the sun doesn't set on the British Empire. And so those positions are always going to contribute to the sustainability of capitalism. 
right? That, that it, they're locked together in that way, which is why I think it, it's important to say at the outset, it's important to be clear and explicit that the way the world is has to fundamentally change. And none of the earlier forms of the world as it was are justifications or are things that we should try to get back to, that what we need is a fundamental restructuring of the way things are. And so the the dominant, the standard arguments from intellectual freedom, the standard arguments about neutrality and objectivity don't fly if you fundamentally think the world needs to be changed. I think that if librarians and people teaching library school were serious about presenting all sides, they would include mm. your book as a required text. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, that's nice to hear. I, I wonder if that'll happen. <laughs> yeah, we need both sides of them to... Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam, for giving your time to us and discussing your book with us uh, for the podcast oh. slash radio show. <laughs> of course. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was great. That was Shouts Timothy Arthur and Joel Bleckinger interviewing Discovery Systems librarian Sam Popowich. If you would like to hear more from him, you can revisit our first interview with Sam from Season 1, Episode 4 for Shout for Libraries, which is available on our SoundCloud, Apple Podcast, and Stitch. And for those of you who are just tuning in, you're listening to Shout for Libraries, and today we're discussing politics and librarianship. To get another perspective on this, next up we have Shout's Hong Yi Gong, who interviewed librarian Margaret Law about her experiences advocating on behalf of libraries. So thank you, Margaret, for taking your time to come to our show. Uh, first of all, could you give us a self-introduction about your past experiences and your current position? Um, I've had a, a very varied um, experience in libraries. I started off working in, after I finished library school at University of British Columbia, I started working for Parkland Regional Library in central Alberta as a library development consultant. Then I went on to work in two other public libraries, back to Parkland as the, the manager, and then I came to work at the University of Alberta as associate university librarian and had a lot of different roles here. The one that at the end of my career was I spent the last seven years developing and implementing an international partnership programs for the University of Alberta. Then after I left the university, I, I thought that I was going to do some writing, but what actually happened is I've ended up teaching at the University of Alberta at the School of Library and Information Studies and also in... Um, at McEwen University in the library technician program and doing a lot of projects for different libraries around Alberta and internationally. So it seems like you have a lot of experience in terms of management. Our topic today is politics in librarianship. So I know you have been a very active advocate of libraries and you have done advocacy with Canadian Parliament in Ottawa and with the provincial government here in Alberta. So I was wondering if you could share some experiences with us. Sure. Um, I thought I would start. I could start by telling you a little bit about why I think we should do advocacy. And for me, the purpose of advocacy is is politicians, in particular, are going to make decisions, and I think it's up to us to make sure that they make them with good information. And I don't think we should let other people speak for libraries. I think that the library community has to speak for itself because for many people. Their view of libraries is shaped by, you know, their high school library or their something they saw in a movie. And we don't want them making decisions on current issues to do with technology and access and things like that based on what they learned when they were young. So that leads me to, to the belief that we have to speak up and speak out. So when I was president of the Canadian Library Association, one of the hot issues was actually the library book rate, which is a preferential mailing rate that is used for things like interlibrary loans. And there was a discussion at that time about re getting rid of it. And the message had to be um, that that really puts people in rural communities at a huge disadvantage because they're the ones that get most of the mailed interlibrary loan. And so I spent quite a lot of time on Parliament Hill talking to people from representing rural communities because they were the ones that cared. So that was um, probably the, that and copyright the most time I spent with the federal government. Um, the provincial government, there's always ongoing issues around funding, around the Libraries Act, around other regulations and things like that. But again, the whole purpose 
is to make sure that when discussions happen, when decisions are made, that they're made with good information. So you just said that you think it's important for the library community to speak up for themselves. Yeah. Yes. And you are teaching the fundamentals of librarianship class here this semester at the University of Alberta School of Library Information Studies. And so, what do you think would be necessary to include in library school curriculum or professionals' personal development in terms of advocacy? And how would people benefit from learning about advocacy? Uh, we will actually, towards the end of the course, have、um, a whole class time spent discussing advocacy. I think. The two things that are most important: one is the belief that it is a professional responsibility, and that even if you're not comfortable doing it, you better be doing it.、Um, the skills, actually, I think, are easier to teach. It's the mind shift and the understanding of of why you need to do it, when you need to do it, and how you need to do it. So we'll be spending quite a bit of time talking about that. Thank you for sharing those with me. So I watched the webinar、uh, produced by you and Punch Jackson earlier this year in May, and it's called "Advocacy: It's a Way of Thinking." So in the webinar, you actually talked about the funding situation in Alberta. When you read stories in the news about other provinces and library funding, the thing to remember is that Alberta gets very little. Alberta libraries get very little direct service from the province. So, is there any difference that you feel advocating with different groups or different government? Would you say it's harder here or easier here to advocate in Alberta?、Um, I think one of the advantages of advocating with the provincial government is they're a whole lot closer than the federal government. And since libraries are a prov- are provincial responsibility,、um, that it's a much closer tie. But But we also have to advocate with municipal politicians who are even closer to home. You might meet them in the grocery store, and so first of all, I think you always need to be ready with what you want to say.、Um, but also, I think it's really important to remember for any advocacy that it's not about what you want; it's about tagging what you want onto what the audience wants. So, if you want anyone to listen to you, whether they're provincial, federal, or municipal. You need to understand what their goals are, so that you can hang the library issue on their goals. And I think that's often where advocates go wrong by focusing on their own needs, rather than finding a way to tie their needs to the goals of the audience. So, what about academic libraries?、Uh, academic libraries need to do a lot of internal advocacy、uh, because their funding decisions, their policy decisions, are actually made by the institution. And so again, making sure that those decisions are made from an informed position.、Um, there's very little direct funding that comes to an academic library from outside the institution. So, a friendly reminder to our listeners: the slides and video for this webinar are available online at librarytoolshed.ca. So, also in the webinar, there's a section in which you tell people about how does your library add value. In that section, you said, "If you're a person that needs to practice elevator speeches, think of the question you got asked, asked most often and have a good answer." So people say to me, "Oh, you're a librarian. Do we still need those?" I have a speech for that. Or, "Do we still need libraries? Isn't everything free?" I have a speech for that as well. So I was wondering if you would like to do an elevator speech here with me. Sure.、Um, do you have a question that I could answer? I、or? do.、Okay. I'm not sure if y- it's a common question or not, but hopefully you could tell us something. Okay. So the case scenario is, let's say if I were a municipal policymaker, and I were opposed to building a new public library because I believed it was a waste of money, and the library would just only end up being a shelter for the homeless people. And does generate security concerns. So, if we were in an elevator together,、um, how would you change my mind, or at least have me reconsider my opinion in half a minute? Okay. Well, let me take a run at it without any preparation. So, Hongyi, it's really good to have this chance to talk to you. I think one of the things that 
um, is interesting about libraries now is that they provide um, a meeting space for people as well as information. And I think as communities become more isolated, that meeting space that is free and available and safe is becoming increasingly important. Mm, that's under 30 seconds. That's very convincing. <laughs> And I would really like to talk about this further with you if I were a politician at all. Let me give you my card and feel free to call me anytime. I'd be glad to talk with about it. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's a really good elevator speech. So how would you say how would you say student could train for this ability? Do they have any technique in practicing the elevator speeches? I think that one of the first things is to get over the fear of public speaking. And once you do that, realize that uh, you just have to practice and practice what you say. One of the things that I think is difficult in the library community and information community is we love words. And consequently, we want to say a lot. And we often want to say too much. And we wear people out without getting to the message. And so paring those messages down to a few words or even a sentence is a good place to start. Were you nervous when you did your first elevator speech? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I heard about elevator speeches, I was pretty skeptical. But what was fascinating in the House of Commons was that often the time that I could speak to somebody was when they were running from one meeting to another, that you scheduled that sort of three minutes as they rushed from one room to another to rush along beside them, telling them what you had to say. And once I'd had that experience and realized this was a real thing, I just started down that path. And I practice it all the time. I practice it, you know, when I sit next to somebody on an airplane and they say, what do you do? Or, or whatever. And the more you do it, uh, the more comfortable you become getting rid of a lot of the ex excess information. That's a wonderful story to share. Thank you for taking your time with us again, Margaret. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks to Sam Popovich and Margaret Law, who we just heard from, for sharing their time with us here at Shout for Libraries. And if you're interested in hearing the rest of Margaret Law and Punch Jackson's presentation, Advocacy, It's a Way of Thinking, the slides and video are online at librarytoolshed.ca. But that's all we have time for today. Oh, but please tune in next month to get your fill of library-centric news. And next month's going to be a great episode mm -hmm. as well, because we will have our hour-long live fun drive episode so make sure you tune in that's right twice as long twice as fun and especially tune in if you're in your car because then we will make your drive a really fun drive you can also check out past episodes on our soundcloud visit our facebook page or instagram at shout for libraries or connect with us on twitter at shout the numeral four libraries once again this has been timothy julia and dan Thanks for listening to another episode of Show for Libraries, and don't forget to check, check it out! out.